Greetings, everyone. Let's talk about this crazy subject we call NAS storage. It's it's a uh, network attached storage has been kind of an interesting thing. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a Chicago-based media entertainment consultant. I've been doing this for a while. This was actually my 25th year speaking at NAB. Um, and I've been lucky enough to share all kinds of crazy topics over the years. And it's been really important for me to be able to do that. But one of the things I'm really proud of is that I, I contribute my knowledge to the greater good. Uh, I, I worked on the ASC uh, camera guide for the hundreds version of the ASC. I'm co-author of the camera comparison chart. And I'm executive director of a non-for-profit in Chicago called Filmscape Chicago that's focused on film and television education. So we like to do this a lot. But let's get on to the subject because we got to talk about data workflows for content creators. You know, NAS solutions are just one part of all of this. And then what I wanted people to think about in here is, is as you're working for in a creative world, you've got to understand how to back up your content. You've got to be able to remain, have it remain accessible. You have to be able to, to work with content in multiple different ways. And, and I always remind people that they have to think about things in a different way. I always, you know, I, I move a lot of data around. I help write the data handling protocols for the camera unit. So my job on set has always been to take the camera data, make multiple versions of it, make dailies, um, segment things out, sync the audio files and all of that, but I'm also interacting with post-production. Um, I'm delivering content to them that they can then start editing with. And, and one of the things that goes into that is, <clears throat> is actually shuttle drives and how you work for them. And I always like to tell people, if you're buying drives for production, buy smaller ones, don't necessarily buy bigger ones. Because if one big drive, which is usually multiple volumes inside, of, uh, inside the case, um, it's multiple physical hard drives inside the case to make one large volume, um, there can be issues with that. And, and that, you know, that could be a problem. Um, and because of that, these multi-drive arrays become um, disconcerting when you use them for production. You know, they can get bumped, they can get jarred, one of the drives can fail, um, and then you lose everything. It's really, really important to think about that. So I always tell people, if you're transferring data between post and post-production from on set to post-production, always work in a single volume drive. You know, um, I, I have some wonderful yellow C drive ruggeds that I use for that kind of thing. I keep them around for that purpose. I want to be able to have content that if something happens to it, I can still pull my data off. And that's a really, really important part about this is having a single drive that you're transferring back and forth to set. If something happens to it, you know, you have got backups, but also it's easier can be it's easier to rebuild and extract the data from if something else happens. And always remember that um, you're working in a world where not everybody has the same computer as you do. Not everybody works on the same platform as you do. I work in an environment where uh, on set I'm on Mac, but in post I'm traditionally in Windows. I have to have technology that communicates all of that and be able to do that. Um, and, and I have one you know, piece of religion in my life and that's drive should never be put back into the cardboard cup boxes they came from to be shipped anywhere. Um, throw that box away, buy a real hard Pelican case, make it work. You know, Pelican cases are the most important part of being able to make this work, or Pelican style cases. Um, and, and people need to, to use that to their advantage. I mean, you can actually get all the cabling in there, you can have in there and the drive stays protected. The drive, you can transport the drive, it keeps it dry, it keeps it out of dust. Because all the things that make drive fail, drives fail, um, is protected when you keep it in a case. So I always do that. I always like to remind that. Um, I always tell people too, make sure you're checking your backups. I'm surprised at the number of people who don't check their backups when they copy something from one machine to another. They're not actually like checking to make sure all the data is there. Um, and some of them aren't even using checksumming technology, whether it's Hedge, Palm Fort, um, you know, Imagine Products, if you're using CI, if you're using you know, any of the applications that can handle data management, you need to think about those as, as tools to be able to um, confirm that you have data and that it's been archived correctly. And, um, Wow, don't ever send original media with the backups at the same time or the same service or even in the same shipments. Um, I, I've had nightmares in my career because of people decided that I could walk in and hand it you know, to an office PA in a production. All right, here are your originals. Here are your backups. Don't send them together. And they would end up putting them in the same box to go together because they, they wanted to save money on the, on the shipping costs. And um, it doesn't work that way. Having to reshoot a day's production is far, far more than the cost of two separate FedEx shipping containers. I mean, I, I can't get people to understand that enough. You have to be really careful about this. You've got to look forward. You've got to be on the lookout for dangers and accidents and, and things that manage. Um, and 
And if you back up via tape, make sure that they're never in the same physical place at the same time. Um, those are simple rules, but it's hard for people to think about that sometimes. They don't think about how difficult it's going to be for them to, you know, handle the, the data that way. And they don't they don't look at it as that, as the same effort as, oh, I'll just, I'll take care of it later. And it's like, no, take care of it now. Um, make sure that your data is backed up in a, in a way that is consistent with the people you're working with. Make sure that your data is backed up in a way that you can understand what it is. Um, you know, I like to use data archiving systems because then I go back and look at my calendar and say what I was doing on that day. And it, it actually breaks down that way. And I, I, you know, use these data management tools religiously on my work. And it means something. You know, here are some of them, like I was saying, is Hedge, Palm Fort, Yoyada, Imagine Products are the, are the tools that I use on a regular basis. Um, these are the uh, keystones of our industry when it comes to data processing and data handling on set. And, and just understand that, that there's different ones for everybody. Everybody has a different philosophy on what they want. Um, and they change over time. Um, you know, Hedge was something in the early days I didn't use very much. And now I, I rely on a lot for some of the interconnectivity that it offers me when I'm working on specific types of production, just like with Pomfort, Pomfort tools. Um, I can actually do live grade and do live color correction on a virtual wall. I can modify the wall technologies using my own controls um, and being able to, to color correct virtual production walls. And that's a pretty important part of the aspect of just understanding how the file management and tools are, that are available to you work in different ways. The thing I talk about is organizational stuff. Now, granted, this is a kind of an old slide because I left it that way, but I, I use the same um, folder structure all the time. So it hasn't really changed a whole lot. This says, you know, this is 3-5-2018. So this was March 5th um, in the American nomenclature. I've got an eight cam folder, a behind the scenes thing, a sound stills folder. I only was a one camera shoot, so I didn't have multiple cameras. But if there was a B cam, it would be listed B cam or C cam. And they would just be there. And I make sure that the, the content is grouped by day, but also by time. Um, uh, you tend to offload data when you work on things and offload it in a, conse in a consecutive sequence, um, particularly if you're working on a, on a big production. When I'm working on film and television productions, I'm getting, you know, it's not uncommon for me to be doing cards on a regular basis all day long. So I'll start at nine o'clock in the morning. We'll do start, cameras will roll at 8.30. I have the first cards by, you know, nine, nine o'clock, 9.15. Not uncommon for me to be doing that on an hourly basis all day long, but it's always about keeping it organized and efficient. It's be making it accessible to anyone else should something happen to you to be able to see what's going on. And remember too, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to drop it in the chat and drop it in the chat. I'm, I, I got the Q&A open also. I, got the, I didn't have the Q&A open. Um, Gonna explain the difference between a NAS and a SAN. Is Nexus a NAS or a SAN? Uh, yeah, it's both actually. Um, Daniel, that's actually a, a, a great question. Let me, let me stop there for a minute and just say the different. NAS is a network attached storage. <clears throat> a SAN is actually a storage area network. It's much, much larger scale, has a lot more controls on it. But in NAS, a network attached storage, were originally defined to be relatively simple devices. And they've grown so much in the last few years. That's why I wanted to talk about them. Uh, network attached storage is a simple device. It just plugs in your network. It a lot of times actually can auto configure on smaller networks, home networks, small business networks. Um, but they have an immense amount of power now. Uh, a storage area network is built on a larger platform. It's be able to, to have many more people connect, um, a lot more feasibility in it, uh, data use, um, SANs and LANs, large area networks, um, or local area networks, depending on which way you look at them. Um, they actually allow you to do a lot of things, but a lot of that technology, a lot of what's been going on has now dropped away and is, it is now um, a part of, of being able to um, you know, show you different ways. But NAS is network attached storage. Um, a lot of people know they started as companies like Drobo, um, which is just filed for bankruptcy. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a real simple thing where you could copy something to it and maybe you could get it off and everything else. The NAS is we're talking about now, the network attached storage from companies like QNAP and Synology, powered by Intel hardware, are give you the capabilities of full network servers did and, and what we used to have for LANs. Um, uh, I mean, I have two NASs in my office, two NAS units in my office. Um, one of them actually has an extender on it. So I've increased it from its original 72, tera 72 terabytes to um, it's now got a hundred terabyte add-on to it. So I've got 172 terabytes accessible across a single device that's got Thunderbolt and Ethernet you know, 10 gig ethernet on it so that I can access it both from within my network or use it as a high speed replacement for things along the line. 
and and so there's a lot of different technologies in all of this, but but NASs are simpler devices. They're designed for small business. They're designed for content creators. And I'll get to more of that in a little bit. But I hope that answers your question. And thanks for that. We'll take I take them all the time. So keep keep asking. So one of the things that people don't think about when they talk about data is what is our data need? How are you going to keep it? What's the are you going to you know how many copies do you need to do? Are you going to archive it right away, or is this something you're going to need for, on a regular basis? Do you think about how much material is going to be captured? How many cameras of what type? You know, um, if you're shooting with two DSLRs, they don't create as much data as one red V wrap. You know, so how are you going to? How many cameras are it is? How much material you're going to capture? What are you going to do with it inside? You know, do you need to have it on set? Are you storing it locally in, on, your, on your production, or are you archiving it for later use? If you're working in a big production, it's not uncommon to have a storage device on your uh, on your DIT card or loader card and be able to have that data locally while also sharing it with a, a remote production group. And that's the important part about this: is think about how you're going to handle data. Um, do you need to keep it locally for matching purposes? Do I need to keep copies of everything I've done through the course of the project um, with me in case they need it back for reference? And as I said before, how are you moving into post? Is it is it a data transfer? Are you sending um, drives to post? Are you just sending dailies to post and giving the camera content later? Um, one of the advantages of NAS technology is you can actually sync, have them sync each other so that if I'm working on set and I can plug my NAS into the network at night when I go, but when I leave set, I can actually let it mirror itself to other devices. And this is an interesting way to, to work for a lot of environments because it means that uh, when I leave set at night or early in the morning, depending on how I what, what time it is. Um, the drive will automatically start sharing that data with say post for the graphics files and you know, um, sound will be able to have access to things, start doing mixing and start doing that. Um, somebody can be doing dailies remotely with that same content because of all of that. And you know, not so much as we used to, but, but I still include LTOs. I, I still include linear tape operation as a, as a, you know, a solution here because a lot of companies, particularly if you work in the military, if you work with evidentiary stuff, if you work with things that are high security, you're going to need to do tape backups. And how are you handling those? Um, and plan the days you're thinking about it. I always find it really interesting is that, you know, people don't understand the storage requirements. They don't think about what they're going to need for daily storage. How many days am I going to shoot? Is it a one or two or three day shoot? How many cameras am I going to shoot? And then, you know, and don't forget to do things like, oh, I've got to add the folder for the BTS, the behind the scenes content. Um, if somebody's like to grab something in their iPhone, do you have a folder for iPhone content? Because that's becoming more and more content. Do you have something for a social media? Folder? Um, these are all new kinds of ways. And the shooting style has a lot to do with data management too. Um, different kinds of shooting styles have different requirements. Um, you know, high speed takes up a lot of data, but you don't use very much of it. Um, you know, if you're shooting a documentary photo style, the director likes to run the camera a lot, that means far more data is going to be ingested on set than you might be thinking of. Um, it's not just, you know, it's not just, oh, we're going to get a few takes. If they like to roll the camera, let the camera roll a long time, which some inexperienced tech crews do, it becomes a problem where you start getting these really, really long records where, you know, you may have 10 or 15 minutes of dead time at the front of a clip where they've started the camera rolling before they say anything and, you know, didn't follow standard practices for that, you know, for the, how you would handle that kind of content on set. So they actually have these issues related to that. And it's like, always think about the shooting style too. The shooting style is a big deal in all of them. Um, you know, do you need it? Do you need to keep it on set? Do you need it, and how do you need to handle it in post? Are you archiving on set? Are you keeping a master archive on set? Is the post people keeping a master archive, or is that being done by a third party? A lot of times, when you're working in high-end television production, um, you're actually dealing with a source or or an intermediary when you're transferring data, especially transferring data electronically. Um, not uncommon to have an intermediary be able to handle that redundancy and archive. And think about the long and short-term requirements. As I said before. It's it's what you need now, but it's also how it's going to be in the future. And even if it's, you know, you're working on a large project. I worked on a project recently, a, a documentary style project where I was shooting inside a restaurant during COVID. A friend of mine opened a three Michelin star restaurant and I just archived the whole process of what was going on. So it's like I didn't really have a set time, but I ended up shooting for, for 280 days. That's a lot of content to start turning out, you know, 20 or 30, you know, 50, 60 gigabytes of data every day. And all of a sudden you shot for 200 days, you've got 150 terabytes of data. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, and then think about the post requirements. I, I, I always find it interesting when people are like, oh, I'm just going to shoot this much. It's going to be that big. And then you, then you get into post and you find out it's like, oh, I need 10 times more volume than I have because I need to do offlines. I need to do onlines. I've got to be able to do graphics and effects. I have a separate total source for grading and that needs very, very high speed monitors and, and color calibration. So plan how you do all of this because those requirements will change on a regular basis. And it's important to think about those changes too. Shoot cameras, again, you know, onset, you know, needs depend on many factors. Um, you know, I always find it interesting. A lot of people think about this, but it's like um, when I do stuff for Hollywood based in Chicago, um, I, I have constant battles with some production companies about erasing the media, the data from the media. Once it's been backed up, I don't need the data to be on a card anymore. Um, obviously, there's a lot of studios that have very specific rules on how you do that and everything. Um, I always try to make sure that that gets you know, done, but, but that's couldn't be a cost factor that you, nobody thought about in part of the production is that if you're constantly have to, to send the media somewhere else, you may end up needing four or five times the media that you originally thought about to be able to deliver it in a, in a simple and effective fashion. And I just think that time editorial is another one of those things that you like to think, how fast do I have to turn around? Am I doing dailies every day? Do I need to actually, you know, I'm making proxy files for, for editorial in that. And how long does it take to shuttle that media drive to thing? Are they doing it? Is it in town? Or are you FedExing those drives out on a daily basis to a location on the West Coast? And, you know, you got to think about all these things when it comes to production. You just got to concentrate on those needs. And don't forget the post requirement. You know, we're talking about, and talking about NAS technology and how it means, but all of these things are important parts of what's going on and how complicated it is. You know, remember the post requirement, the type of production. Documentaries, commercials shoot, you know, sh commercials shoot far less material than documentaries do. Advertising work tends to be much more concise, particularly tabletop advertising work. You won't get to near as much data as what you thought of. But if you're shooting a documentary, man, it's run and gun. You're just letting the cameras roll because you want to get as much of the content as possible. Um, and determine your workflow for all of this. I always find it real interesting. You know, if you're doing YouTube, IG, TikTok, you're doing industrials, you're doing commercials, you're doing documentary work, you're doing episodic television, you know, which is, which is close to now it's minor feature films or feature film work. All of these different kinds of, of production have different requirements and different needs. So it's always thinking about how that works for you and what that means for you and what you're working on. Um, it's always important to understand that your needs are the most important for the production itself. And, and think about these other aspects of it. Are you planning on doing an offline? A lot of people want to shoot an 8K. I'm still not a fan of posting an 8K till you get to the very end. So that means you're going to have to start working in online, offline. How do you create these file names? How do you create the naming? Do you syncing the audio or the, are you, what, what kinds of things are you allowing to happen? You know, how many versions you're going to have? What kind of about the graphics and effects? How are you going to render it? Um, all of these things mean how much storage it is. And, I, and like you laugh and say, well, what do I need to understand storage for renders? And it's like, well, you'll have, you'll have mistakes. And those mistakes take up volume. And those amount of renders, how you archive the individual data on all, every production is important. And a lot of people don't think about those things. They don't think about how much space graphics and effects take up because they're a different file format with an alpha channel. Um, you don't think about how the elemental process of building those graphics takes space because you want them to be able to control it in a different way. Um, it's understanding those items that actually allow you to become a much better player. Hang on one second. I'm not used to talking. Um, finishing and grading. Oh, I jumped past it, but finishing and grading was one of those things at the very end. And it's like, if you're going to finish and grade a project, understand that finishing and grading in HDR is going to take up much more space than if you're grading for the web in Rec. 709. And, and, and think about it, you know, less than a decade ago, um, working on a native camera native file more than a gigabyte was nearly impossible. Now it's actually normal. Um, you know, and that's 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we just barely touch the surface on the digital revolution. Um, you know, I like to remind people that the, the point in time where digital became dominant was Fukushima, which is March in 2011. And at that point in time, 12 years ago, that, you know, that's when digital all of a sudden became a totally different problem for us. And I laugh at this because at that point, you know, a decade or a little bit more than a decade ago, 
even compressed HD tax most systems. I mean, we were still fighting long GOP MPEG, um, you know, uh, uh, for compression on some files used on lower end cameras and just the render times and everything on that were ridiculously difficult to work with. So I always remind people that, that the, con the technology is constantly changing. And think about this too. 90% of conference, uh, content on TikTok is edited, generated and edited on mobile. 90%, more than 90% of TikTok. Now, we know they're not, you know, they're backing up to the cloud and stuff like that. But if you're a TikTok producer, and you're doing content on TikTok, you need to think about how you're going to work in those environments and create that kind of content and how you're going to archive it and back it up. It's just as important. Do you get it off your phone? You know, do you purge it from your phone? Do you keep it on your phone when you do that? You copy it all off. How do you actually handle the data transfers on the phone, especially as it's gotten more and more complicated to handle it? Are you using third party apps? Um, you know, are you using something like Filmic Pro or LumaTouch where you're you're using the those as elemental parts of what your workflow is. That's important to understand too, that you need to think about that. But as we get to all of that, we need to start talking about emerging technologies and talk about what this means for it, which is what we're basically talking about for the rest of the show here. And, and, and it's like, we want to talk about NAS solutions for small business because this network attached storage. And, and these things range from, you know, you can get one with two drives in it, or you can get one with a hundred drives in it. They literally scale that that level to that level now. And it's important to understand that those are the kinds of tool sets they're going to be able to do that. NAS solutions allow you to do in-house networking. I mean, this is one of the most amazing parts of them. They, you know, they're most of them are built to be attached to 10 gig networks. A lot of them have Thunderbolt on them. So I can use it as a direct attached storage for high-speed workflows, for post-editing, for graphics, those kind of things. But I can also let everybody else in my, my facility or in my office space share that content in the same manner. That's an important aspect of all of this. It's not a this wild, oh, gee, I've got to build a million dollar networking solution that's going to be able to take that. You can actually build these uh, solutions relatively simply and relatively easy, and you can train them to sync themselves, which is a really important part of this aspect. Think about being able to tell something. It's like, okay, when I get done with this file, when this file tends to finish this processing, it immediately is then transferred or copied to multiple locations inside your building. So that I finish a, a file in, in ingest where I'm loading content on the file in a, in a collaborative effort. Well, the minute I get done with that, or the minute I stop doing it, the machine stays on and then it starts sharing that content based on the folder structure into different departments. Editorial gets the proxy files that are synced with audio. Audio gets the, you know, gets the proxy files, but they also get the separate audio files as independent things. Graphics department is getting both full res and, and proxy versions for what they need to do. And then visual effects gets the elements that they, they get. And if you're in a closed environment or a closed loop environment, like many production facilities are, particularly the smaller ones, that allows you to share all this content easily, simply, and quickly that you never thought about before. And, 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 you know, the small and medium business benefits are kind of amazing. This ability to locally cache stuff that allows you to access it, but it also gives you access to cloud data. I mean, if you need to share across a larger network, whether it's a LAN or WAN, you can now sync to the cloud, whether it's through AWS on Amazon's, it's Azure, it's through Massive for file sharing, there's lots of different ways to be able to do it. But now you can have these ability of these cloud NASs to be able to sync your data, not only locally, but to the cloud to be able for repetitions, for backup, for reassurance, for all of those things. And most of them support the widest range of cloud services. So I can work with Azure, I can work with Microsoft, I can work with um, uh, Adobe's file programs, I can work in environments where, you know, I have to work with, you know, AWS for a client, or I have to work with um, a, a different, you know, editing system, a different storage system, and all of those are available. Um, the question before about Nexus came up and it's like, you know, think about having your storage linked to your, you know, your office, provider storage and be able to sync that content 
across the board. Um, you know, and, and, and it's having those multiple devices on an environment that allow improved rewrite formats. So, you know, they allow multiple file access protocols so that you can have different layers of connectivity for different people in the office. You know, the graphics people need the high res file, but you don't want to give the editorial people the high res files because then they'll slow their process down. So you always make sure that, that the editorial people only get the proxies. The graphics people get this. The audio people get that. The, you know, the final VFX people only get the master files with the linking data to be able to do the edits. And a hybrid cloud, you know, cloud environment should be for tiered storage. You can actually set different versions. Am I just backing up to the cloud? Am I mounting storage spaces from the cloud? How do I handle all of this content in this environment? And, and then the other great thing is, is that there's all these apps that are available for it. This is one of the most powerful parts of, of why I started using NASA's is that it allowed me to do things I'd never thought about. Um, I'd never you know, considered it in a way that, that it allowed me to um, expand my environment. Um, by using you know hybrid clouds or being able to share across multiple volumes or those kind of things it became a really really interesting aspect from all of it. And I show QNAP here because I have a working relationship with them. I don't get paid to use their information, but I grab their pictures a lot. And but think about how a Thunderbolt you know related NAS. For those of you that don't know, I'm a real big evangelist for Thunderbolt. Um, it fundamentally changed the way I was able to work in post of being able to have um, a single cable that allowed data networking, you know, Ethernet, everything on one storage capacity through one cabling simplified how I was working. And, you know, it's the way that Apple's gone on things, but it's also fundamental to show people that that's an important part of the aspect is just how complicated some of this is. But it allows me high-speed transfers. Um, my unit uh, is set up, it's got 12 drives in it with an MVNE um, or high-speed, you know, caching system on it. Um, it's got 128 megs of RAM. Um, it has suffers, it has 10 gig Ethernet plus it's Thunderbolt. Four, so I have this ability to use it as an attached storage for the editing for graphics and those kind of things, but also to be able to share that content and be able to let other people share on it too. One of the fascinating things for me is being able to have this multi-use environment as a small businessman, as a content creator that allows me to handle these kind of functionality. But I can have somebody, you know, accessing their mail on one port and then, you know, being able to read files for audio on another, being able to work on graphics on a third, and I'm be able to do high-speed data transfers for any of the stuff I'm working with. And, and this is all based around, you know, what can be done with Thunderbolt Ethernet workflows or with Thunderbolt networking. Um, a lot of devices have multiple Thunderbolt ports on them, which allow you to use that Thunderbolt cable in the same manner. Um, and, and first thing everybody's going to say is, well, those are kind of short. And I said, ah, don't forget optical cables. Um, I use a lot of optical cabling for this kind of things where I can be, you know, as much as you know, 60 meters from my device and be able to have full connectivity, full bandwidth at 40 gigabits. That's kind of an impressive way to do this. And it works on Mac and Windows. I, that's one of those things that just I'm always surprised about is that people that work in, in post environments, you've got to work on both platforms. And it's got to be function. The functionality has to work for everybody on both platforms. And you can't just uh, live in a silo and say, I only work on Mac, I only work on Mac. When, you know, if you start talking about Unreal or any of the other things, a lot of applications only run in the Windows platform. You have to use that kind of technology to your advantage. And don't be afraid to, to embrace it. Um, I've always been somebody who's had to work in both. So I, I think about that in that manner. And don't forget that these tools allow you to build your clacks, either cloud, personal cloud access. This is one of those important parts of what network attached storage can do for small businesses and content creators. It's like, now I can share this. Like if I have, you know, small shops are, are the way of, of the future. Um, as we've seen with the strike that's going on right now, we've really got to be a little more cautious and, and concerned about how we you know, build content, control content, how we share content. But what we've also seen is, as an output, an output of COVID was that now not everybody's in the same location and we're not sharing this content you know, across the you know, or room, we're sharing it to somebody in a house you know, miles away or cities away or countries away. And that's an important part about this aspect. So now you can actually build your personal cloud to be able to support that. And as a content creator, as somebody who's creating content and sharing it with other people on a regular basis, having that ability to control my own storage device, to control my own compression, control how people get and access my files um, without having to use, you know, Dropbox or OneDrive or whatever solution you have that's one of the generic ones out there. I mean, I keep reminding people that Google. Google Drive will replace your 
like content almost immediately. It recompresses it. Um, and if you drop a video file on a Google Drive and you let it set for more than 72 hours, it's not the same file that you started with. It's actually been recompressed to save space in Google's environment. So they've they've taken your original camera file and and while it may say .mov or dot you know R3D or something else, it may not actually function that way when it comes back out. And that's one of the problems. Is, uh, and I said R3D. That's actually one of the file types that it doesn't embrace right away. But if you drop a, an MOV or an MP4 file into the Google Drive, it's going to recompress it in 72 to 96 hours. You're not going to have any choice in it. It's going to do it automatically. And still photography, I found this in still photography a long time ago. But what people don't realize is that if you're using these default tools, you know, OneDrive, you know, Dropbox, Dropbox is terrible about it, recompressing things. You can't have that kind of content. But having your own storage solution that other people can access gives you that power, gives you that control, and allows you to be in charge of what's going on. It also means you can actually control the multimedia environment. Um, one of the things I kind of laugh at in, in a lot of environments is I have to preview a lot of video all the time. So I'm always looking at content. And rather than bringing it to my laptop, I've actually got my system set up that I can trigger my NAS to play out to a, a you know the, the monitor I have or the display I have set up in my conference room. And then I all of a sudden say I can play out and I can have content playing in a room that I'm working on something else. And I can have you previewing content in real time because most of the new NAS solutions offer playout services. Um, and that's an important added benefit for all this. It's, you know, it's an HDMI port on it, but I can actually trigger these things to play the files that I've got on there. It's a great way to just purse through, purse through information and look through things, but it's also secure. And, and that's another important part about this is that this personal cloud solution is easy to set up. It's simple to, to maintain, and it's more secure because people are not going to be looking for, you know, the, uh, the, the biggest baddest in the room, being small means you're invisible to a lot of things. It's not as easy to, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes easier to break into those kinds of systems. But the reality of it is, is that you're kind of hidden from those environments. You're a smaller footprint, you're a smaller name, and therefore not somebody that's on the scope of, of you know, scammers and, and attack bots and everything else. So you have a more secure content when you're working with a private cloud. And there's backup and snapshot protection, particularly for Windows users. Snapshots are a big deal. Um, the Mac doesn't do it that way, but on the Windows, having snapshots of where your drive was in different periods of time can do things like alleviate driver problems if you're having issues on set. Um, so there's a lot involved in that. But, but then you also have the capability to back your hard drives up and back your laptop up and back your desktops up and have that content know that, that the operating systems and those kind of things would be more secure. But it's also your personal content. Um, you know, how are you saving your emails? How are you controlling your chat messaging? How are you dealing with all of that influx of data that we get on a regular basis, right? All of us have a lot of that. And, and that's a thing. And like I said before, you know, you can have the connection to a TV monitor, monitor content. I think that's kind of an interesting aspect for all of this. And as I'm sliding into the, I'm, I'm actually a little bit ahead of schedule here. I gotta talk slower. Let's talk about Thunderbolt for this, because a big part of my lifestyle is actually making sure that the connectivity I have works for me in a NAS, for NASes. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't look, realize that, you know, Thunderbolt's only like 14 years old. Um, it, it's, it's not a technology that a lot of people, it's a technology that changed fundamentally how we were doing things. Um, I, I, I can imagine how many of you worked with, you know, um, the various stages of Firewire. Um, in the day. And, and, you know, it's like, oh, I remember, oh, you know, can't use USB for that. You know, you can't use USB for data transfers. You can't be used USB for this kind of, but this collaborative effort in this environment with the way that Thunderbolt has evolved, you can now actually do Thunderbolt networking. And that's a big aspect of all of this, being able to work and, and have content and be able to, to network without having to put in a TIG and switch. I can just plug a network cable in and I can have multiple computers accessing the same, you know, Thunderbolt NAS that it gives me all of the power and control, but then gives me 10 gig ethernet speeds. Um, for the connectivity. So I have these capabilities that are, that are changing constantly, um, that are constantly evolving and constantly being used for a lot of things. And it's now to the point where we're, we see Thunderbolt on everything. And, and certainly, you know, with the specifications for USB-C, um, USB-C 4, and Thunderbolt 4, they've kind of changed the way we've done connectivity. And, and you know, I, I kind of laugh, people laugh, people talk to me about, well, you know, is 40 gigabits a second faster? It's like, well, you know, the fastest me camera meteor writes only writes at about 
um, five gigabits. Um, so we have the capability with camera media is, is minimized by all of this. When you look at, I can now do four streams of a single camera thread. I can actually have speeds over Thunderbolt with, you know, solid state environments pushing, you know, beyond four gigabytes a second, you know, and, and maintaining data rates um, for high end post-production uh, over Thunderbolt at, you know, beyond 3.5 gigabytes a second, you know, and that's, that's a massive amount of data to be able to moving, be moving in world. And it's constantly evolving. Um, there's, they're, they're already working on the next generation of it, which is due out in about 2025, um, that will have even better connectivity and better interactivity and better usefulness in all of that. And still using the same USB-C connection. I don't think people are, are have realized how powerful that cable and connector is and how simple it has become. And remember, if you have questions, but not hesitate to ask anybody. Um, I put this in there because there's so much confusion about Thunderbolt. Uh, I recommend if you have have to argue with somebody about Thunderbolt things, take a picture of this. You know, grab a screenshot of this because it's pretty funny. But you know, there's multiple different kinds of cables, and the cable configurations all mean you know different things. Uh, um, you know, all of the rest of them, are, you know, DisplayPort, how it handles USB C, USB, you know cable simplification. Um, the simple one is look for the Thunderbolt signal. Um, that Thunderbolt with a four on it means it's the most current cabling possible. And we all need to, to, to honor that. Um, I know people have questions about that. Why don't you start queuing those up so I can start answering some of your questions? Because we're, we're not quite to the end, but I know that we've got some stuff going here um, where I'm going to want to, you're gonna, all going to have questions about the kind of things I'm talking about. And remember too that, that there's speeds, USB versus Thunderbolt and everything else. Um, these are kind of the minimum requirements, maximum minimum data rates. Um, this is, you know, you think about it. the minimum data data requirement is 32 gigabits a second there. And and you know, being able to have multiple displays and everything on a single connection, my entire uh, desktop space is all cable over Thunderbolt. Um, I just find it really, really easy. Um, my monitor has a hub in it. So I've got four Thunderbolt connections in it. So I can plug into my monitor. It delivers hundred watts of power to my laptop, which keeps my laptop power. Also delivers DisplayPort back to the monitor. Um, so I get power and, and video um, on a single cable here, but it also gives me that extensibility that I can do other things with. Um, my, you know, my camera plugs into my monitor, my, everything is controlled in a way that allows me to do. And that's the part of all of this is that I want to keep talking about is, is that this connectivity and this interconnectivity and how we handle things together is an important part of why networking is important for content creators and for small businesses. And, and don't think that you're any different because of your one or the other. I think that people need to think of those as, as the same because any small business nowadays really needs to concentrate on being able to share content and work with multiple individuals in a real-time environment. And Thunderbolt's about the speed and the connectivity. It's, it, it really is in a way, you know, that has changed everything. It's Mac and PC. Um, I, I, I work on both platforms religiously. It's not something I can get away from. Um, but I still think that people don't think about it. Um, one of the th also things with Thunderbolt that you don't think about is DMA, the digital asset, digital media assets management controls. I mean, it's the, the protection that allows you to keep copyrighted material from being stolen. Um, it causes problems sometimes when you try to connect with a cable that doesn't have that capability um, and it can be things, but the, the Thunderbolt technology actually protects your data and protects the copyrights of individuals to working on. We think about that. And you can connect more devices with Thunderbolt. Um, you know, being able to connect, you know, multiple devices, six different devices on each Thunderbolt port allows a lot of interconnectivity for devices, uh, both over Thunderbolt and over USB-C. Remember that, that you know, US, the USB-C protocol, the USB protocol over USB-C is different than Thunderbolt and they're not necessarily compatible back and forth. Um, Thunderbolt sees all of the secondary protocols, USB stops at Thunderbolt, so you can't do that. So you have to uh, think about those kinds of aspects in it too. Um, Let's talk about some of the solutions that are out there. Um, I, this is from my friends at QNAP, and they started with one Thunderbolt NAS. Um, they were doing, you know, at Adrenaline Films, which is a small production company. You can see a Blackmagic, you know, switcher in there. They're being able to do stuff. Um, a lot of storage, a lot of different kinds of storage. They were actually working in this where a lot of different um, individuals were able to, I think it's an eight different individuals were able to connect to their NAS and be able to do that. Um, they started with, you know, the model number there is given. Um, I never worry about model numbers because they change all the time. So just everybody think about how much you need and what it is. This was a 12 bay unit. I had something similar in my office. 
Um, but you know, 12, 10 terabyte drives is 120 terabytes of data, you know, and you, you then you raid that in RAID 5 or RAID 6, and all of a sudden, you know, you're talking about it's 100 terabytes of data, and you have 100 terabytes of data with full redundancy. And you can directly edit 4K video, uncompressed 4K video, because of the, the capabilities of this network attached solution. Um, you know, and, and, and it's not just the capability, it's not just a box that you cut from, it's also the ability to share all that information with different aspects of what you're working on. And and I think it's important for people to think about those kinds. And, and this media collaboration goes back and forth. It's, it's every way you can possibly think about it. And, you know, USB-C works across the board in all of this, but now we're sharing Mac and Windows files. So it's not limited to that. I know a lot of, you know, a, a lot of sales platforms, Salesforce in particular is another one that likes to really likes to be on Windows. And it allows you to work in that. You're working in Unreal. Uh, if you're working in an environment where you're collaborating with an Unreal developer and you're doing things for virtual production, you have this capability of actually being rendered connecting between them. And the, the devices, the receiving device doesn't care. The sending device doesn't care what, what it, the platform is. So you now have something that you can access from both environments. This is how View Networks does it. Um, the, uh, the big scalable uh, virtual production company that's based in Orlando and Dallas, uh, Orlando, uh, Tampa, Nashville, Vegas, and then five or six other remote places, they actually use these sa the same NAS technology, these NAS units specifically, to actually share between their different sites so that they can have access. So the models that are used in, in Unreal are shared between access. The, the graphics information that could be used from one environment to another is shared across the multiple locations. And this is, and this is the most powerful way to work where you've got, you know, facilities in different cities in Florida, in Nashville, in Las Vegas, and they're all sharing the same content in relative real time because of the capabilities of how these devices talk to each other and how that works, not only sharing to the cloud, but staying secure and sharing across their private network. Those are the powerful parts of all of this. And, it, and, it's, and it's the most efficient way to collaborate. Um, and certainly without the constraints of having to fight Dropbox and OneDrive and whatever other solution you're working on, because this is just easier that way. And, and, you know, the NAS solutions give you the best of both worlds. You kind of get all of these in here. Um, you've got to be sure that you understand all of that. But, I mean, think about having this in here where I've actually got PCIe cards where I can actually have content there. I've got MVNEs, SSDs, very, very high speed stuff, um, which allows for the caching purposes. Now, having, you know, two or four terabytes of MVNE storage up front that operates at about five gigabytes a second means that any of the information coming and going into the computer is cached in a formal way that allows you this high speed transfers and it allows for much, much better. But you know, you think about just the interconnectivity of all this, multiple ports, how the Intel systems work. And, and of course they toss in this slide for me and it's like, I include this just for, cause you, you know, occasionally you have to talk about the tech stuff, um, but, the flagship ones of these are really, really powerful. They're actually replacing the kinds of servers you would find on, on wide area networks, on WANs and LANs, because they're just so powerful and have so many capabilities that you don't think about it. And I seem to have lost that slide in the middle of talking about it. But I mean, um, my capabilities has, it has a, 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 I've not only got a web browser in it, um, I run my Slack and Discord channels. Um, off my own server. So I don't have to worry about paying a service for that. Um, I have the capability to mirror it. I have a calendar system that um, used for my not-for-profit is on my own server. And those kind of things give you more power. They give you more capabilities. They give you more control by being able to handle those kind of things. <clears throat> And because of the kind of system is, I've got multiple channels of RAM. I can go to 100. Mine, mine doesn't have 128 gigs of RAM in it. Mine only has 64. But 64 gigs of RAM is still a lot of RAM for a device that's that you know that people use in this manner. But RAM makes servers work faster. So this capability of having this great deal of RAM actually gives me benefit. Hang on one second. Um, somebody mowing outside. Um, and think about this when you're building your storage solutions, whatever kind of storage it is. Um, always think about the fact that having both um, hybrid hard disks and solid state disks give you much more price for performance. Um, solid state is always going to be faster, but it's always more volatile. Um, I mean, a lot of people forget that, you know, solid state SSDs um, have come down dramatically in price, but 
you know, there's issues with them that, that cause problems. If they lose power when they're writing, they don't necessarily work right. Whereas, you know, hard disk technology, hard standard hard drives, still a wonderful legacy technology, still very affordable in our systems and good for lots of things. So combining those two things in your solutions actually give you the power to do both. I can use an SSD for the speed and relative access, and then I can use hard drives for the long-term storage, which is going to cut my overall cost of my, my device much, much by, a, uh, it's going to reduce the overall cost of my device by a great degree. And this is one of those solutions that come out. A lot of NAS solutions come up, and I don't think people realize it, I'm talking for a minute. A lot of NAS solutions actually allow you to pre-build. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that. I like to tell people that if you're buying the drives from one source and you're buying the NAS solution from another source, <clears throat> Um, it, it becomes a little more complicated in how you do maintenance. Whereas if you're buying a NAS solution with the drives internally built by the manufacturer, it's a much, much easier way to be able to do that. Even though it's hard to get a lot of the manufacturers to actually include drives in some of their technology. I like to make sure, tell people to, to make sure that they're always thinking about how the repair process is going to go for the work. Are you going to be able to you know, repair the content? Are you going to be able to get the drive repaired in such a way that it's easy, has ease of use and maintains in your own workflows. I think that's an important part of this too, is you have to understand that that's part of this issue too. But, and also in these kind of configurations, I also find it interesting because I'm using one of these, these multi-unit sessions as an expansion for my standing array. It connects over USB-C. So the Thunderbolt connection on it actually allows me the high-speed data link to this additional storage. So I can actually expand the NAS technology I have in my office. And I find it really, really interesting. At San Francisco State University, they have a hybrid solution. So they've got regular conventional hard drives. They've got, you know, um, SSDs for the front end. And then the students in the thing use the, the network attack storage as an on-premise cache solution um, built with, you know, specific hardware from QNAP. And then they use AWS, you know, Amazon's cloud service as their storage. Because this is written in a proprietary way and it's working with San Francisco as a way to do that, they have access to this wherever they go. And now you see solutions that this is this is how businesses are going to work in the future, whereas they're going to have, you know, localized access to it, but then shared the access to a larger environment across the cloud. And those are great solution providers and great things to be able to do in an environment where we're constantly on the move. If you're working in a production that has to work around the world, there's no better way to be able to trade data is than using the cloud. Um, it, it may not be that for individual content creators or for a lot of smaller facilities, but know that in the long run, at some point in time, you're going to start working in environments where you're going to have to share the data in a larger platform. And having a solution, a storage solution that you have in your office that gives you that capability is NAS, and it works much, much easier. And again, back to adrenaline, I, I, I got these out of whack. I forgot to change them back. But now they have the capability to have multiple NAS solutions. So adrenaline actually has this with multiple units and expanded units, so they can have as many, I think they have uh, 20 editors. So they have solutions that are capable of, of supporting as 20 editors simultaneously on projects. And then you're expanding them with 10 gigabit and 25 gigabit connectivity, whether you're using um, 10, big, 10 gig ethernet or 25 gig ethernet, you now have the capability to use these devices that connect at very, very high rates of speed. And that allows multiple editors to work on them, whether they're local over Thunderbolt or whether they're using the infrastructure built in on a different floor or in a different department. And that's the, the message here is, is that this is bringing the simplicity back to how storage is supposed to be. Um, you know, if you work in a medium-sized company, if you work in, you know, a, a segment of a much larger corporation, whether it's banking or business or finance or a municipality, um, getting your capabilities to be able to have your data access controlled locally is a, is a big deal. And a NAS Solutions offers that workaround that a lot of environments will work for or, or allow. Um, I, I talked to an IT guy at a major college. And one of the discussions we had with him was, was, well, how do we work around the, the inability of the, you know, the school's network to be able to support what we're trying to do? And he says, well, we can put a network node in here that's private to, you know, the, the media department. And you can control storage on here because it doesn't have to be configured. It doesn't have the software constraints. It doesn't have the, the security enabling things that attaching another full 
WAN or LAN level server on it. The NAS capabilities, because it's in a network attached storage appliance, you just plug it into the network and it just turns on. And that became a simple solution for a couple of colleges I've worked with to work around the IT infrastructure problems. And while you're not necessarily the best thing in the world, it shows the simplicity that the simplicity of these devices actually work to your advantage at times. Blue Origin, uh, yeah, um, you know, um, the Jeff Bezos, Bezos rocket plan. Um, they actually do on-site editing with their launches. So when you see the Blue Origin launches, they're actually doing their editing on site. And it's a completely mobile studio. Um, they drive up with a van and everything's replicated. Um, and, and this is an interesting point where they, they have, you know, the mobile solution is identical to the studio solution. They just have it in the back of a van. And then they have the capability over the connections that they have to replicate their data in real time back to headquarters. Um, and, and again, this is what we talk about when you kept having, you know, functionality and duplicity and having the ability to make archiving and solutions that are, that are usable for everyone. And this is what it allows. And, and it's funny because I, I added the Thunderbolt connectivity at the bottom of this because people said, well, how do they connect internally if, if they're sending all this data back to the network? And I said, oh, the network's taking the 10 gig Ethernet and sharing that way. The internal solution, the editors are all working on Thunderbolt. And there's three editors and a, a graphics person, two editors and a graphics person working in this environment for Blue Origin. And they're all working in Thunderbolt off the same NAS because they have the capability as a read and write to each other in the files and the file system is set up so that they can share content. And it's also, but they also also been compartmentalized so that the graphics guy can be working on something independent of what the other two uh, editors are working on without bogging them down. And then someone who's ingesting material, bringing content from somewhere else has the, the fourth capability here where you now have all of these people working on the same NAS in the same way, but two of them are working at it over you know, Thunderbolt um, networking. And the other two are working as direct attached storage because they need the speed to edit, to be able to deliver real-time con content. And, and it, it's interesting. I, I always think that um, people are always um, laughing about the kind of stuff. Um, think about how your hybrid solution works. Um, you mount cloud storage and five service on your NAS, and then it mirrors on your NAS for faster access. Um, this is important, particularly when you're working across you know, multiple states of data. Um, this is a real simple, easy way for a hybrid cloud to work. So basically your cloud is being mirrored on your drives and then you keep it locally for storage, but then for archive purposes, it's on the internet. Those tools are powerful, but it's also how it goes back and forth where you sharing content in and out in multiple environments where it's not just what you're doing here. You can actually share it in in Taiwan and Taipei and New York City simultaneously and have that capability sharing that way where it's actually shared across multiple environments. I'm surprised I don't have any questions from you. And then QNAP's got a data protection plan. I, you know, we think about this all the time. I always talk about how you're actually <coughs> working and protecting your data. Think about this. This is the most, one of the most important things you have to do. You know, are you dealing with the local? Is it remote? How much you're backing up and syncing in the cloud? NAS solutions allow you to do all of this in a simple manner. And, they, and, and understand these solutions start at a couple thousand dollars um, and go up, you know, scale up to, you know, 32 bay units with, you know, 10 terabyte drives. But all of a sudden you've got, you know, 32 terabytes or 300 terabytes of data um, in one facility that you can connect over a single cabling. Um, that's an important access point. And it's a thing to understand is, is that you have to think about this in this manner. You have to think about what you're doing locally and how you're backing up your content, how the remote access is handling your data and whether that needs to be backed up too. And if you are doing it in a larger basis in a larger environment, are you backing up to the cloud? How are you storing that archive? Where is it accessible from and how, who is it accessible to? You know, the security aspects of all of that. Um, question on there says, what is the throughput on these NAS systems? Well, at, at minimum, when we're talking about over Ethernet or Thunderbolt networking, you're roughly 650, 680 megabytes a second. So for the networking access, when you're working in 10 gig E, that's the kind of the specification for 10 gig E, um, that's how fast you're working in, which was more than enough for most editing process and everything. Maybe not enough for graphics in the same way, but that. But then you have the capability of going direct attached. Um, with Thunderbolt capabilities in these devices, I can direct attach to them and then access at, at the speed of Thunderbolt or the speed that my NAS has been configured on. So con 
Traditionally, uh, across the network, I will have a volume that is shared by everybody. I'll have another volume that is, you know, designed for graphics or audio, and then I'll have my ingest volume, which is designed for both me and the editors, and that's set for the highest level of throughput. Um, I, I break it all of that um, and, and have it that way. It's it's kind of interesting to be able to control all of that and think about it in that way. Um, Daniel's asking about the the distance limitations of Thunderbolt. Um, I have uh, the current specification for a full active cable um, optical is 60 meters or, you know, 192 feet. Um, uh, and the reason for that is, is that it, it has to do with the display port reference and return on display port. You can actually transfer data at greater speeds because you're not dealing with the delay factor of the display port. But most Thunderbolt cabling, Thunderbolt 4 cabling, Thunderbolt 3 cabling um, is going to be limited to a distance of 60 feet, uh, 60 meters. Um, but remember that if you're working in 10 gig ethernet and you're handling these data is over ethernet, that file is, is far, you know, far, far more capable and the distance is far greater. Um, not uncommon to be miles apart. I actually uh, work on a facility. Um, one of my clients was Target Corporation and they had remote processing from a facility that was 22 kilometers away from their hub. So we were working at a distance of, with over 10 gig ethernet, being able to control stuff over um, a distance of, you know, roughly 11 miles. Um, you know, 11, 12 miles um, of distance, being able to have full access and full connectivity. So those kind of things are important too. You understand that. But the speeds we're talking about, the minimum speeds we're talking about are, you know, the 10 gig E speeds, the Thunderbolt networking speeds, which are in the, you know, 650 to 680, just under 700 megabytes a second um, for data transfer on a continuous basis. And that's the specification for all 10 gig E deliverers. Typical usage, okay. storage, and all of that kind of stuff, content creation, surveillance is one of the other aspects of all of this. Um, uh, I, I don't work a lot in surveillance stuff in it, but I always include that because because um, people don't think about that in their home networks and their business network to have a separate environment of just that capability around. So um, it's that. And uh, scalable performance. Yeah, I know. We're getting to the end here. I gotta, I gotta. Um, I'm Gary Adcock. I'm the program manager. And I thank you for joining us for this morning for NAS Solutions.